So thank you. I'm glad to be here talking with all of you. Um, so okay, so this is uh, the talk I'm going to present today is um, is based on a paper that Kep and I wrote and published two years ago, in which we defended, I mean, we gave an interpretation of Pryor's famous argument of thank goodness that's over, in terms of, uh, we, we read it as a knowledge argument, so we made a, the, uh, we compare it to Frank Jackson's argument and we had a claim. So this is very much based on that paper, but we, uh, I'm trying to extend it. And then also recently, uh, I've been, we've been discussing these issues, uh, particularly with John Perry, thanks to the reading group, but also talking about Pryor, about the similarities between Pryor's case and, and, and John's cases. So this is, let's say, the first attempt that I'm, going to, that I'm trying to make to kind of bring together all these ideas, the ideas from our paper, the ideas from conversations with uh, John and Pryor, of course, okay? So, um, so this is the paper I'm going to discuss. It is a very short paper, very well known, very much discussed, and it was published in 1959, and it's called Thank Goodness That's Over, TJ from now on. So I'm going to have two claims and then two short comments. The first claim would be, so usually this paper uh, has, a, has usually been read as an ontological argument. So as Pryor is presenting an ontological argument and defending the reality of McTaggart's A-series. I will come to that now. And I'm going to defend that there is no clear indication in, in the paper itself to conclude that Pryor is actually discussing ontological issues. So I question this interpretation. There's going to be some reading of the paper, just some key paragraphs. And I'm going to discuss also at the end of the presentation and an exchange that Pryor had with Jonathan Cohen right after the publication of the paper. They, they were discussing about the paper, about the content of the paper. So what Pryor explains what he was trying to do in the paper. Uh, the second point is I'm going to give an interpretation of Pryor's argument, um, and I'm going to claim that Pryor is really dealing with issues of cognitive significance. So in a sense, what I'm going to say, what I've been trying to say is that Pryor in that paper somehow anticipates uh, many of the issues that Perry uh, discussed in his uh, Frege and Demonstratives and mostly on the problem of the essential indexical. So I'm going to offer an interpretation of Pryor's arguments in Thank Goodness That's Over uh, using a broadly Perry's framework. So this is like the two main points. And then I, I'm going to just touch upon two further issues that I think are in need of development, but I think they're interesting. First, first one is I'm going to discuss a little bit of opacity. So this comes from discussions with Perry, but mostly Kaplan and Deaver in their 2013 book uh, claim that both prior challenges and all of the examples and issues that, scenarios that Perry discusses are really cases of opacity, not uh, cognitive significance. And actually, he's, they're not the first ones. So Cohen, in the exchange with Pryor in 1959, already says that you know, what Pryor is talking about is basically a case of referential opacity. And Pryor says, no, it is not. It has nothing to do with that. So I'm going to just connect these two issues just to mention them and see Pryor's answers and see Perry's answers to that challenge. And the second one is just, just a little kind of historical point about Pryor's own views, because he did have an ontological view. He was a big defender of the McTaggart A series. He was a presentist, but he kept a concern about um, the way we talk in ordinary language about tense and about indexicals. And in particular, like maybe almost 10 years after the publication of this paper, he changed his views on, uh, on the now, on the indexical now. He changed it to you thanks to the readings of the works of Castaneda and, and also of Kant, but mostly Castaneda. So there is a connection there. There is a link there. There is a, a constant concern of prior about natural language, about the way we talk about tense and about indexicals. And, you know, of course, the role of Castaneda is a sort of a link between prior and Perry too. So this will just be short uh, comments. So, some terminology first for, very briefly, for those of you who don't know what this whole A series, B series is. Um, so, 
so we have a series or a time, whatever. Basically, I'm, I'm just going to be very short. It's just to have something to in common. So a series would be, uh, according to a series, positions are ordered according to their having properties of being past, present, and future. This would be the a properties. You know, so an event has the property of being future, and then has the property of being present, and then has the property of being past. So these a properties are actually real elements of reality. You know. Um, on the, on the contrary, the B series, according to the B series, positions are ordered by two place relations earlier than, simultaneous with, and later than. So this would be B relations. So an event is um, later than another one, then it's simultaneous, then it's earlier than another one. So you know, the, an event doesn't change A properties. Right? So this is just. Um, so the question, of course, is, is there an objective difference between past, present, and future? I mean, the, are these like really pieces of reality's furniture, or are they just you know, parts of human cognitive and linguistic apparatus? I mean, obviously, we do talk about events being in the future, in the past, in the present. But is it just the way we perceive things and the way we talk about events and things that happen, or are they really part of reality, or are they both? Well, according to the A series, the flow of time, the flow from future present to past is real. So it's, you know, they have a tensed B of time. And according to the B series, it is not. It's just an appearance. It's just the way we see, the way we perceive time, but it's not real. Okay? So that would be a tenseless view of time. So there are many arguments for the A series, for the B series, but one of the arguments that Comes, uh, comes along always in favor of the E series is the one that we're going to discuss, Prior's argument. So according to this, Prior, uh, in the paper that we're going to see now, he would say, okay, the B series, the tenseless view of time, leaves something out. <coughs> and he would say that a view that denies the existence of A properties offers no grounds for tense thoughts and tense emotions. So if we want to, to, to explain tense thoughts or emotions like relief, anticipation, hope, we need A properties. We need to include past, present, and future into the reality. So B theories would like the tool, the tools to warrant thoughts about past events and the emotions, like you're thankful that something is over or regret, and the essential differences with events that, about future events. You know, you cannot feel anxiety, hope, whatever. This is the standard interpretation of prior. The standard, this is, if we take prior to be arguing in favor of the E series, it would be something like that. I'm going to question, is, that, is this so? So when I explain it a little bit more, we'll see it. Is, is this the case? Is prior's argument really ontological? Um, so this is like the famous paragraph in the, in, the, in the paper. It's a very short paper. It's like six pages, but everybody quotes this paragraph. So I'm going, there's going to be a little bit of reading in this first part, but I hope it's not too much. So he says, half the time I personally have forgotten what the date is and have to look it up to, or ask somebody when I need it for writing checks, checks etc. Yet even in this per perpetual dateless haze, one somehow communicates, one makes oneself understood and with time references to. So one says, for example, thank goodness that's over. Say, um, with that, he says something which is impossible that any use of a tenseless copula with a date should convey. It certainly doesn't mean the same as, for example, thank goodness the date of the conclusion of that thing is Friday, June 15, 1954, even if we said then, even if it's, we said it then. Nor for that matter does it mean thank goodness the conclusion of that thing is contemporaneous with its utterance. Why would anyone thank goodness for that? Incidentally, June 15 was a Tuesday, 1950. But I, I kept the Friday for you know, historical reasons or whatever. But it was a Tuesday. So you know, these are the three things. So a way to put it, I'm going to put this, the three utterances. You know, I, I kind of change, but in a small way. So in the imagined circumstances with a, a date haze, dateless haze, or, you know, the following utterances wouldn't say or mean the same thing. So we have one, thank goodness the episode is over as of now. I should have changed the B, forget about the B, keep the S. Thank goodness the episode 
is over as of Friday, June 15, blah, blah. And thank goodness the opposite is over as of the time of this utterance, right? So this is a bit of a spoiler of what I'm going to say, but basically one seems to express or convey relief on its own. Right? It doesn't need anything. Thank goodness this is over now. Two uh, would require something else. I mean, if I say, thank goodness, the conclusion of this episode is on 23rd of May, then I need something else. I need, for instance, to say that, okay, today is Friday, June 15, 1954. Otherwise, why would I be thankful that the thing is concluding on that date? Unless I know or I add or I presuppose that it's today's day. And three is just a very weird center, sentence. I mean, you, it's just a kind of a complex way uh, of saying one that it might it might be uh, I mean it's a weird sentence I mean nobody would say that I mean you might say that after uh, after this talk or after if we are discussing indexicals but otherwise we would not say that so what is it that makes people exclaim one and not two or three upon say for instance leaving the dentist office with the famous cases the root canal after a painful root canal why what makes people exclaim one on the ontological reading and the ontological interpretation of Pryor's uh, argument, they would say, well, because one and three express different propositions on the, or they say different things. So an utterance like one and the corresponding A thoughts, an A utterance required the existence of A properties. Here, by A thoughts and A utterance, I just mean a utterance is an utterance that includes an indexical or tense, so it's a tense utterance. And an A thought is a kind of thought that is most naturally express, expressed by using an indexical, right? So it's the kind of thought you would most naturally express using indexicals or using tense. So the difference in meaning in one, two, and three amounts to a difference in the properties of the events we are talking about. Right, that would be, that's actually the standard reading, the, the, the common one, okay? So we get the reading, we see, we see we're the same, well, they say different things. We're talking about events having different properties. You know, the first we're talking about an event having the property present and it's an A event having an A, uh, sorry, an event having an A property. It's two and three, we don't, we don't have that. Okay, so this is a standard interpretation. What does really prior say, and this is where I'm going to give you a few paragraphs. Just an explanation, a little bit of explanation of the paper. So the paper, uh, again, is pretty short. And actually, uh, Prior is discussing the, uh, the, the proposal by Wilson where he develops uh, what he calls a substance language. Um, so he says, I'm just going to read. He says, Professor Wilson begins something which badly needed beginning, namely the construction of a logically ri rigorous substance language in which we talk about enduring and changing individuals as we do in common speech. This is the beginning of the paper. So he's talking about the work of Wilson where he analyzes the way we talk in common speech about change, about the passing of time, as opposed to space-time language favored by many mathematical, mathemat mathematical logicians. He, calls, he keeps on going. He, he now he's going to compare it with Strawson. He says, has at least one point of superiority with another rebel against space-time talk, Strawson, namely, namely Wilson, the seriously attempt to meet formalism with formalism. So he's going to, to develop a, a formal way of treating with these issues. And another point, however, Strawson seems to me to, be, to see further than Wilson, because Strawson, he says, is aware that substance talk cannot be carried on without tenses, whereas Wilson tries to do without them. So prior, uh, Prior's goal is to keep tenses, keep them in the logic. He's going to, he's, famo he's famous for tense logic where tenses are treated as primitives and operators. But he says, we need to take these tenses that are you know, um, key in an ordinary speech, uh, speech and we need to bring them to logic. But the key, the focus is on the way we talk, the way we talk about tenses. Then he keeps saying, and this is where we reach, he says, Wilson's uh, chief quarrel with ordinary speech is, as he says, that it omits dates. 
but it is misleading to treat this as pretending to do so without a tamed reference. And now this is the, the part we already read. I do not know how it is with Wilson, with Wilson but half the time I have you know, I forget the date and I don't know and still, even if I don't know the date, I am capable of communicating and with time references. So one says, thank goodness that's over, blah, blah, blah. So this is what we read. And this is how it begins. This is the last part. This is the last paragraph uh, after, immediately after the one before. It says, Wilson seems to have the notion of a tense cop, seems to have the notion that a tense copula with is uh, analyzable into a tense lens one uh, with plus a date. But the above example is sufficient to refute this assumption. So it seems to me, I mean, if you analyze these paragraphs, I know there's, there are more, but if you analyze these paragraphs, which are the key ones in my opinion, he doesn't seem to be talking about ontology. He seems to be talking about language, not even about logic. Actually, in the, in the exchange with Cohen, Cohen is going to say, well, I assume Prior is talking about logic and when he talks about anal analyzable, he's talking about logically analyzable. And Prior answers, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how we ordinarily understand uh, tense expressions like, thank goodness that's over, thank goodness that's over at this particular date. So he actually says, no, this is what, what I'm concerned with, the way we talk. But there's no, at least there's no clear hint that he's arguing in favor of any ontological um, position. Of course, his view might have ontological consequences, but that doesn't seem to be the core of the argument. So just sticking to the text and reading what he says and what he says in the discussion with Cohen, I think it is the simplest alternative reading, the, sim the simplest interpretation would be one in which he's talking about differences in cognitive significance. So embedded within Prior's challenge, there is a claim about the object of emotional reactions, utterances, and thoughts. So we have two options here. Uh, we say these so-called so A properties, past, present, and future, must, must get into the picture. That's, that's what Prior seems to be saying. But the question is, do we have to get them into the picture as fundamental elements of reality or as ingredients of the contents of utterances and thoughts? I'm going to agree with two, but with qualifications, with a lot of qualifications. So it's agreement, kind of, sort of agreement. So I'm going to say the differences between one, two, and three are differences in cognitive significance. But I'm going to argue, oh, you know, just that one is unjustified. It's not only unjustified, it's not necessary. It's superfluous for what he wants to do. To do. So the inference from the tense nature of some of our utterances and thoughts to the fundamental tense nature of reality of time seems unjustified. I mean, at least with these arguments. So, if we analyze in the normal interpretation of uh, what Pryor says, we see we have the three utterances of these three sentences, and then we have three claims, three different claims. First is utterances one to three express different propositions. Second one is utterance one and three are associated with different thoughts. And the third one is the proposition related to utterance one and its associated thought requires the existence of an A property of events. I'm going to analyze the three of them. I'm going to say this is okay, this two, no, or not necessarily at least. Right? It doesn't, they don't follow from what Prior says and we don't need them. So let's start with the, uh, with the first one. Uh, so the first claim is I'm going to reject this. Utterance one or three express different propositions. I'm going to say no, at least not necessarily. I mean, not in, under my point of view. So if we, if we interpret it, this as one or three express a singular proposition that contains the same time, Friday, blah, blah, blah. By that I mean, I, I just mean that one or three have the same truth conditions. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to get into, you know, what do you mean singular propositions or, I just mean, we, could, we can agree that one and three have the same truth conditions. There is one fact that makes them all true or false. And the fact is that, you know, the, the, the event, as far as it contains, the, the fact is that the event has to have concluded on Friday, June 15, 1954, right? So the utterance, uh, this moment of time is referred to by one, the utterance of the implicit, explicit, uh, indexical now, because you know it, it, it wasn't there, by the name, Friday, by a date, or by the predicate at the time of this utterance in three. 
So we have one moment of time, the episode, and three ways, three different ways to make reference to that moment of time. But it is one single moment of time. So they, they do seem to have the same truth conditions, right? The problem, of course, is that they have uh, different cognitive significance. By cognitive significance, broadly speaking, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean here that the speaker is in different belief states. That's so. I'm going to explain a little bit more now, and the hearer gets different information. Upon hearing one, two, or three, you do get different information. And what I'm going to say is the dif different belief states, the motivating thought behind those utterances is also different. Okay, I'm going too fast now. Okay. So, um, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I think they do express the same proposition in this sense. But of course they are associated with different thoughts. Um, remember, the priors, the, the, the guy who went out of the dentist office is in a perceptual, no, per it's not perceptual, it's per perpetual, mm -hmm. uh, dateless haze. So he doesn't know the day he lives in. In that situation, obviously one is the most natural, um, practical one to say, thank goodness that's over, or thank goodness that's over now, right? Uh, it's just a natural way. If you don't know what day you live in, but you just went out of the dentist, oh, thank goodness that's over. I mean, that's just a natural thing. Two is just unavoid un unavailable to him, right? He doesn't know the date, so he cannot utter two. It's just un unavailable. And three, again, is just weird. It's just a weird way, <laughs> talking reflexive way of, 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 of rendering of now. So. <laughs> That would be weird, especially after a root canal. I mean, you don't want to say all of that. Uh, but, you know, so the idea is the motivating thought of the guy who went out of the dentist is essentially indexical, essentially tensed. That means, um, it, I think that means, and I think Perry, when he says things like that, also meant to say this, that it is the kind of thought that is most naturally expressed by using an indexical, right? It's just the kind of thought that you would, the, the most natural way to express that thought is by using an indexical or using tenses. So uh, that, that is why he would use one and not two or three. But there might be different circumstances. I mean, there might be different cases where the motivating thought is not essentially indexical. So imagine this is an area, imagine that uh, suppose the New Zealand Dental Association, prior was from New Zealand, uh, announced that starting on Monday, so the next Monday, although, you know, uh, in three days, uh, June 18, the new price for a root canal would increase, right? So the, the guy who went out of the dentist knows that. So Arthur, let's say Arthur, his name is Arthur, uttering two would sound perfectly natural when he's presented with the bill. He sees the bill, he says, thank goodness, uh, I had my root canal on, the, my root canal was on Friday, June 15. It's perfectly natural. That's, you know, the, his motivating thought explains this. He could have also uttered one, thank goodness that's over now and not on Monday or three, <coughs> but that would have be, that wouldn't have been very helpful in terms of communication for people who don't remember that the following Monday is June 18. So you want, the important thing is, thank goodness, my root canal was made before June 18. So you want to emphasize that. So that's why uh, the most natural one would have been two. So, you know, and you, you would be perfectly uh, justified in being thankful that your root canal was in that particular date, regardless of whether it is, you know. Okay, so, so that was very basic. Um, does this have any consequence for the existence of any properties of events? Uh, well, not really, because uh, this is the third point, because I have claimed that one and three have, are all made true or false by the same fact. So it's a fact that involves Arthur, his thankfulness regarding a, a, a root canal performed and concluded at a particular time on a particular date. So it doesn't matter what event that Arthur is thankful for is in Arthur's past, present or future. I mean. What matters is that at the time of the utterance, at the time of the utterance, Arthur is thankful about an event that occurs on Friday, 
fifth, about the conclusion of an event that occurs on Friday, blah, blah, blah. But that's a B event. That's a, you know, a B fact. That, that there, there are no A properties there. So, just to emphasize, I'm not claiming that uh, there are no A properties. I'm claiming it doesn't follow from Prior's argument. At least it doesn't, doesn't necessarily follow. It doesn't. It just, he doesn't need it to explain why it would be, you know, in, in, the, in the circumstance that he described where the person doesn't know the date, it would be absurd to utter two or three. It would be the logical one to say, well, well yeah, that's, that's the easy explanation. So, uh, prior peri and cognitive significance. So that, that's a kind of review of the paper. Now the connection, uh, I mean, more explanation. So as I said at the beginning, I do believe that prior uh, anticipates many of the issues discussed by Perry in Frege and Demonstratis and mostly the problem of the essential and lexical. Um, and one of the reasons, I'm going to compare it with uh, one of Perry's examples. And I'm going to say there's a, you know, there, there's a very strong equivalence there. The prior's challenge to be theorists, the supposed challenge to be theorists, um, you know, in, in terms of language and thought, involves an epistemic issue regarding the connection of different kinds of thoughts uh, through identity relations. So remember, Arthur doesn't know what day he lives in. He's in a perceptual, again, per perpetual, dateless haze, okay? I guess it's also, also perceptual, because, but anyway. So, the available and most natural option would be one, utterance one, associated with an A thought, which just basically means the kind of thought that you would most naturally express with an indexical regarding the conclusion of the root canal. Two is not an option because it includes a date and he doesn't know the date, given that he lacks the relevant B thought, the thought that you would mostly express with a date. He lacks, what he lacks is the knowledge of this identity. He knows he lives in today. He, he needs to know that today is Friday, June 15. So it's not enough for him to know the date. It's not enough for him to know that today is today. He needs to do that today is that date in order to be thankful that the root canal concluded in that date. So he lacks knowledge of identity, of this identity that would allow him to link the kind of the A and B thoughts, the date with today, right? So, something very similar is presented by Perry here in, in what he calls the tardy professor example, a very famous example. He says, a professor who decides to attend the department meeting on time and believes correctly that it begins at noon sits motionless in his office at that time. Suddenly, he begins to move. What, ex what explains his action? A change in belief. He believed all along that the department meeting starts at noon. He always believed that. He came to believe, as he would have put it, that it starts now. So you have the meeting begins at noon, the, me the meeting begins now, okay? Did the prof so one question, first question. Did the professor know that the meeting was to take, uh, was to take place at the same time he was uttering five? Five is noon. Did he know that the meeting was starting, beginning just as he was saying the meeting begins at noon? Well, in a sense, in a very weak sense, we could say yes, because he knew the meeting was at noon, and noon was the time at which he was uttering five, so in a sense. But in another deep, deeper sense, we say, no, he didn't. Our professor, as he sets off down the hall, might say, I believe the meeting starts at now. In accepting the format as an explanation, we would be assuming that he believes it is now noon, right? After all, he believed that the meeting started at noon all along, so that belief can hardly explain the change in his behavior. So it's a similar case. The professor only gets to know the meeting start now. I, I, I better, you know, get up and go to the meeting room when he realizes uh, that seven is the case, when he, when he realizes that the identity. So when he would have used the word eight, when he would have used the word now to express what he knew, that is, he would have had an A thought, right? It's only when he would have the kind of thought that you would most naturally express by using indexicals such as now, is only when you have that kind of thought 
that, uh, he would know that the meeting starts now and that would explain his action. But we need that to explain the action. So again, uh, the professor and prior. The professor had a be thought about the meeting. Given his ignorance of the relevant identity, he has no a thought about it. It's just the opposite case. In this case, he knew the date, but he didn't know the date, the, the time, sorry. He didn't know it was now. He doesn't know the new meeting is beginning now or at present. So he had the B thought, not the A thought. So just, just, just as B thoughts, like thank goodness that concluding this date would have been insufficient to bring about Arthur's thankfulness, B thoughts alone are insufficient to bring about the appropriate actions by the professor. Just as Pryor said, the knowledge he needs, the knowledge the professor needs, is something which is impossible that any use of a tenseless copula with a date should convey. So this is a long quote. This is Perry again, um, but I think it's worth uh, reading it. So, he says, you know, uh, when a believer moves from context to context, his belief states adjust to uh, preserve the belief's health. So as time passes, I go from the meeting will begin to the meeting is beginning to the meeting has begun. All along, all along, I believe of noon that it is when the meeting begins, but I believe it in different ways. And to these different ways of believing the same thing, different actions are appropriate. Preparation, movement, apology, because you're late. So he says, we have here a metaphysically benign form of limited accessibility. Anyone at any time can have access to any proposition, but not in, not, not in any way. Anyone can believe of John Perry that he's making a mess, his other example. So we all can believe in John, of John Perry, John Perry is making a mess. And anyone can be in the belief state classified by the sentence, I am making a mess. Anyone who is in a supermarket or whatever other place and you're making a mess, all of us can, can, can be in the belief state classified by the sentence, I am making a mess. But only John Perry can have that belief by being in that state, right? <coughs> only John Perry can have the belief that John Perry is making by being in that state. As prior sufferer that we've called Arthur might have belief all along this root canal should, would conclude on Friday, blah, blah. So that belief expressed in two can hardly express explain his relief, his feeling of thankfulness. He must have also believed that the date of the conclusion was now, right? So that's what Prior is saying, basically. Uh, so the difference is not in what is represented, because it is in how is represented. And if there is some ontological conclusion we could directly get from there as well. So one way to see the difference between the A series and B series is just we have just one series represented, uh, described and thought about in different ways. But this is kind of a bold claim, right? So this is the, the main point of the, yeah, okay. So this is the main point of the, of the, of the talk. I mean, not the main point, but you know, uh, a rereading of prior. Now to emphasize what I've said here, I want to contrast this with claims of opacity and, uh, and then give some more information on prior. So prior, Perry, and opacity. So they have both been accused of, you know, not accused, they have both been read as presenting uh, examples and scenarios that can be explained away uh, through opacity. So Jonathan Cohen in 1959 said, well, the, 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 the scenario prior is presenting is really a question of opacity, it's referential opacity. He said, you know, it's just a question, if you say, thank goodness that, then you get into intentional with S uh, context and then, yeah. but actually he, in a footnote that I'm going to discuss later, he says, well, okay, being exclamations, uh, exclamation, thank goodness, what is at stake are not truth values, but rather sincerity values. Still, we cannot substitute co-referential uh, terms uh, without modifying the sincerity value or the truth value. And uh, more recently, Kapanlia Diver would say both Perry's and Pryor's case, cases involve opacity and can be seen in what they call Frege's counterpart. So there's nothing particular about tense, there's nothing particular about indexes. <coughs> Actually, they do, uh, when they discuss Pryor, they do say, okay, Pryor, you know, the, the Arthur, uh, Pryor's case is just like Perry cases, but the difference is Pryor has a point. He has a good point to make, and that is the ontological 
argument. He, you know, prior is uh, making a very deep ontological argument. Per is just trivial. I mean, it's just, he doesn't, and I'm just claiming, no, he doesn't do any ontological argument. So they are both trivial, if we accept that, if we accept this thing. Uh, there's no deep ontological argument there um, in the case of prior. So, okay, opacity. Standard definition uh, of opacity, kind of neutral sentences or positions are referentially opaque just in case they are not transparent. That is, if the substitution of co-referring terms or phrases could potentially alter their truth value. Okay, that's standard definition. So is there opacity in these cases we've been discussing? Well, let's go first with um, what Cohen says. Again, Cohen, um, Cohen actually had read a book that Pryor had published the, the, the year before, that is Time and Modality, I think, where Pryor uh, claims that tenses had to be introduced in, in logic as, as um, primitives, you know, as operators in, into the logic form and not the logical content. So he reads Pryor's thank, uh, thank goodness that's over as a logical, you know, as discussing a logical issue. None of them talk about ontology. Prior nor Cohen, they just, Cohen thinks it's logic, Prior says, no, I'm not talking about that. And then Cohen answers, okay, so if he was not talking about that, you know, I don't care, my comments are not relevant. So he says, but he presents a kind of a funny example. The expression, thank goodness that, renders what follows it intentional, or, or as Quine calls it, referentially opaque a context to which ordinary laws for the substitutivity of identicals or equivalent doesn't apply. Consider a woman who looks out of the window and says, thank goodness it's sunny and we're going for a walk. Now, it's logically true that it's sunny and we're going for a walk, if and only if, neither it is the case that neither it is sunny, nor is it sunny, nor is it the case that neither we are going for a walk, nor are we going for a walk, right? But it would be rush to infer from this that the woman who looks out of the window, thank goodness for the whole thing, right? Uh, so, so this is the example he gives. And basically what he's saying is, if Pryor is giving this argument to say that we need to introduce tenses as, as, as uh, primitives in the logical form, then, hey, watch out, then we will potentially need infinite operators and infinite elements because we can rep uh, duplicate um, Prior's example with conjunction and with and, with neither, with anything. So we potentially, we will need infinite primitives in our <laughs> logical language. To this, Prior has two answers. The first I'm not going to uh, discuss, but he basically says, okay, so what? So we get infinite primitives, so what? Who cares? Basically, I mean, he basically says, okay, if we have to do that, we have to do that. But second, he says, anyway, no. First, I'm not talking about indirect discourse. The problem I'm, dis I'm discussing appears also in direct discourse. And he says, basically, I would contend that neither, neither, nor P, nor P, nor neither Q, nor Q is not what we ordinarily mean by P and Q. Though we can see, uh, when we think it out, that it necessarily has the same, same truth value. And that consequently, in any system employing the form P and Q only as uh, such an abbreviation, we will be unable to express truth involving S and ordinary use. Again, he's saying, no, I, I'm not talking. In ordinary, the way we talk, the way we understand it. And he says, whatever advantages there might be not symbolizing any and or not, but just the ones defined in terms of neither and nor, nevertheless, the truth functors that we immediately understand are just and are not. And what we ordinarily understand by P and Q is different what we, from what we understand by neither, neither, you know, the whole thing. Uh, because intuitively, neither is not a primitive at all. And you say the same thing happens with tense. Uh, you know, intuitively, we get the tense. So he's talking, he's saying, no, I'm not talking about, you know, okay, if you want to talk about logic, still is not an objection. We can have as many primitives as as we need, we can get them into the logical form, so what? But anyway, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking the way we ordinarily talk about P and Q or about tense, the way we understand it, this is what I was talking about. This is what concerns me. And these problems appear in direct or indirect. So I'm going to 
come back to coin now. So this was settled there. They, they didn't talk much about opacity. But recently, Kaplan and Lieber say it is familiar. It is a familiar and much investigated uh, fact that the principle of substitutivity, substitutivity of co-referential terms appears to fail in certain kinds of linguistic contexts. Much of what has been paraded as instance, instances of essential indexicality is nothing but an instantiation of this apparent phenomenon. Uh, so this is what they say. Uh, obviously, uh, <coughs> the clear answer would be no. I mean, if we mean by cognitive significance something like a competent speaker might regard a sentence with a referring expression in it as true, while regarding a sentence with a co-referring expression as false, then you know, that's, that's what Frege meant when he says someone who doesn't know that the morning star is the evening star might regard the one true and the world false. But that doesn't seem to have much to do with opacity. Uh, substitution of co-referring expressions do not change uh, the truth value of the report. Because as I say, well, if you go with Frege, you, you would say, you know, say one to three, they express different thoughts. But again, that would not be a problem of opacity because for Frege in indirect context, um, the expression will not be co-referential because they refer to the senses and not to the usual references. But if you go with the kind of a position I'm defending here, they do not change the truth value of the report, but it might, okay, it might lead to misleading reports because of the differences in cognitive significance of the embedded sentence. So, Things like why would why would we be, you know why would anyone be thankful for two or for three? So these are kind of misleading, but they are not. There's no problem with truth value there. Um, so there's no opacity involved. This is Perry's answer. This is not my answer. This is Perry's, and he says, well, there's no opacity involved. There are no belief reports in it. In this, either in neither in Pryor's case nor in his case with the tardy professor, the truth conditions are the same, of one to three. Uh, but the motivating thoughts are different. So we might talk, again, this is just uh, something uh, of conditions of sincerity. So the speaker might, must be relieved that the episode is over as of the time referred to. But there's no, there are no truth conditions, there are no truth values there. So now gives us a way of referring to the moments we are finding out about without, without being able to identify them <coughs> by dates or times. And just, just to finish, just to, on this point, Cohen seems to kind of not anticipate and not even agree, he's talking about other things, but immediately after he says these are cases of referential opacities, he puts a footnote and he says, of course, you know, they are exclamations, they are not neither true nor false, so we cannot say that substitution fails to preserve truth, truth value. So, I mean, he acknowledged that, but he says, well, an exclamation do have some some, somewhat analogous properties, such as being that of being either genuine or not, either appropriate or inappropriate. And certainly both the sincerity value and the appropriateness value of thank goodness that's over now might be affected by the sub substitution of as of this time of utterance. So there seemed to be in St. Tony Cohen in 1959 and a, a Perry's answer to Kaplan and Lepore, but it, you know, Kaplan and Lever, but it seems clear that there doesn't seem to be opacity involved there. And to conclude, just two minutes, because it's over now, I just, uh, this is again very much uh, kind of just a bunch of ideas that I, I was putting, but actually if you think about, so one question would be, so why is the ontological interpretation so prevalent? So why does everybody think about that? Well, there might be different reasons. One of them is Pryor himself defended the A series of time. He was a presentist uh, all through his career. So through his career, but I want, what I want to argue is, yeah, but he was also very much concerned with now, uh, with indexicals all through his career. So he was a presentist. He believed in the redundancy of the present. So he say, well, if you say it is cold, it is now the case that is cold. It is presently the case that is cold. That's redundant. That's, we're just saying the same thing. The same, it has the same meaning. The present doesn't add anything. So he says being present is just being. You know? So actually, he introduced operators in tense logic, but only for the past and the future, not for the present. The present was a sort of a <coughs> zero time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to skip this. this so 
he kept this view of the present until his death in 1969. Uh, but in 19, between 1967 and 1968, that is almost 10 years after Thank Goodness That's Over, he uh, wrote this very famous paper now. He actually wrote one in 67 and then now in 68, which contradict each other. And in there he says, well, all of a sudden he says, okay, the present is redundant, but we need to do something with the now. We need an operator for the now. He says, now, however, oblique the context, oblique, 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 the context in which it occurs, the time it indicates is, is the time of the utterance of the whole sentence. So he said, the now is a sort of a pointing tool, ref, uh, a reflexive pointing tool. Uh, so the present is redundant, the, no, the now is no. And he explicitly acknowledges here in other papers the influence of Castaneda. He read Castaneda and he said, well, his proposal to treat now as an analog of the pronoun I uh, was very appealing for him and for him, the, the acknowledgement of this reflexive element common to uh, now and I was what made him change his mind. Also the work by Hans Kamp uh, in ways to formalize it. But I just think this is, I mean, it doesn't prove anything, but it's an indication first of how Pryor was concerned through all his career about the way we talk about tense and about the now and the way we refer to time in ordinary language, in common speech. And also the fact that he was so impressed by Castaneda's work and that he, it motivated him to change his views about the now. I mean, I think there is a clear link there, a clear, uh, common set of problems and questions that both Pryor and Perry has been all discussed through the years. So that's it. Oh yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I'm completely on board with this, and it seems that uh, you can do more or less the same thing with locational words too. So for instance, I'm here versus I'm in Paris, for example. Right? And one way I think of showing that it can't possibly be to do with, with time capacity is if I say I'm here, uh, so let's suppose that here, let, let's, let's, rule, let's rule up here and in Paris as used on a particular occasion. I'm referring to the same place. Um, from neither of those individually can you infer where the speaker actually is. But if you say, I'm here in Paris, yeah. right, or a better example is it's, it's raining. This is, a, this is a, a, a case I actually used in a, in a volume on John's work, actually. Um, if I say, it's raining here, and I say, it's raining in Paris, okay, from neither of those can I infer it's raining here in Paris. So if I'm yeah. raining here in Paris, as a, you get an extra piece of information from that. Yeah. That the speaker's in Paris, which you can't get from either of those individually. So there's a sort of cognitive connection that's being made that simply can't come from the senses themselves. So it can't be to do any sort of referential opacity on it. I would have thought something very similar could be done with the, with the, um, the temporal case, that I just did with the spatial case. It seems to me exactly analogous. And, and again, you wouldn't draw the ontological conclusion from these examples, uh, thank goodness I'm here, thank goodness I'm in Paris. You, you couldn't possibly draw the, the ontological conclusions about, about, the, yeah. about the space, uh, the spatial locations, any more than the other case. Yeah, there, there are some, actually, but I, 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 I've, I've thought about it, but I do have to think about it. There, there are people who have tried to say, you know, we cannot, uh, actually they have to say, Prior's argument in favor of A series doesn't work because if you, if you put it in terms of here instead of now, if spatial indexicals, well, then you're going to end up with a lot of you know weird properties, you know. Um, but there are some tricky issues there in the difference between space and time that I really don't know how they work. But I know there are some tricky issues. So that's but yes, I mean you, you could do that. And with time, you can say I'm um, I'm thankful that this is over now on the 23rd of May, uh, because, you know, 24th is my birthday, whatever it's not, but, you know. So, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, I have to actually work a bit more on that, because I, I know that there are some problems, ontological problems, not, I mean, in terms of cognitive significance, in terms of the way I think, yeah, it, it, they work perfectly. But I know some people have said, yeah, but it's not the same. I mean, we, the space ontology, time ontology, we're talking two completely different things. 
So I, I do not have an answer. I know some people have said there is a problem there, but I don't really know what the problem is. But at least shows that the reference capacity cannot be... The oh, yes, 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 so yes, yes. Exactly yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. The yes. Must be wrong about that. No, the, the 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 actually actually I had it here in kind of an appendix. I think it's worth showing maybe. So actually, their claim they use space. They the, what they say is something like that should be could be read as that. This this would be the Frege counter, but it's a complete. It's crazy. They change here, but it's like what what what? I mean, it's difficult to understand what what they try what they were trying to make there. But they they use here instead of. I mean, you know, so that's the Frege counterpart. So, I mean, so that's why I've, I've, I thought it was interesting that first, I think clearly it's not an opacity case, but it's, it's worth contrasting opacity with cognitive significance. And it was also interesting that, you know, Pryor himself said, no, what, opacity? No, that has nothing to do with that. Uh, but it's and still... Then he wrote that paper a few years later called Reference Opacity. Where exactly, yeah. Yeah. Mm. But yes, I should, yeah, probably the, the space introducing that would help. Mm -hmm. It would be, a, yeah. Just a follow up. <coughs> In mind. There is an, an, an analogy between uh, vocational and lexical, and, uh, but there may be a level of the cognitive significance of motivation of beliefs and phenomenological difference because we can move in space. But that, yeah. There's no choice. There's no choice in space. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that would be if you want to. So the people who have tried to put the ontological argument in terms of space yeah. indexicals, there, there are some issues there that have to do with. But, but he was right that okay, yeah. that's, that's you know, with, uh, with opacity. opacity, and it, it would reinforce the argument if you if you put it with yeah, with space. Yeah, but for me it seems pretty clear. I mean, he does talk about ontology on the thank goodness that's over on the paper, but not, you know, just because he he talks about some other thing that Wilson said. He's not talking about his claim and ontology in, in a very weak sense. But he it, it does. It seems so clear that he's not defending the existence of a properties, at least not there and not directly. So why would people just take it? Yeah, this is Pryor's argument in. Ontological argument in favor of the A series of time. Like, why? What? I mean, the guy clearly said, no, I'm talking about the way we talk about time. So, I mean, he says that on several occasions, so I, I just thought that was very weird. Maybe also have anticipated some of Castaneda's style, uh, right? Namely, well, for Castaneda's, uh, The only way we can uh, freeze them is from a third person perspective using crazy indicators. Uh -huh. So the now can be frozen only frozen on the photo, only using the then. I only using she herself because she started with his stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There is something in that. Yeah, there is a connection. Just, um, he actually he in 67, he had this paper and about the present, and he said both the present and now are redundant. You know, they, they just don't add anything. And then 68, he said, well, no, they are not. You know, and then Castaneda has shown us and the blah, blah, and, you know. Uh, so, so it is interesting how shocked he was by both Castaneda and Camp, and how he kept talking about ways we think about and ways we talk about tense and, and now in ordinary language. Um, so it seems to me that he's talking about the same thing through his career, um, and it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah. There's a problem for Christianity if he's wrong as well. Because it's going to mean there are thoughts that God, because if God's present at all times and eternal, then there are going to be thoughts that God can't have, that we can have. Come on, come again. If God what? what? So there are going to be thoughts that we can have. It's like, a debate. like I'm sitting here now. Right. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's just, it's so he cannot. Only you can have that thought. 
Yeah. That God cut them out, which would be pretty bad. For Christianity. That would depress Pryor a lot because he was super Christian. But Kretzmann was claiming God cannot get in Castaneda and say, this is the first time in defending God. He say no, because he got the prize indicator and he can get God he got the crazy indicator and he can God, so God can't use indexes, but he can use crazy indicators. He cannot use high yeah. to refer to me. But he can use now and here. Yeah. One, so you can trust more. All right. Well, he can't know that I'm yeah. okay. That's cool. But, but that that would be a problem. I mean, that that's that's a limitation of God's. Yeah. Or I guess you could. Yeah. So you can still have a God, but not as cool as the. Yeah, not as powerful. <laughs> but I guess you could say if God is, you know. Is a, has the point of view from God's point of view from nowhere, that o might also mean he also has the point of view from everywhere, so that means he will be able to be in your belief state. I mean, if we want to defend the guy. Times, I don't really understand it, to be honest. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but I'm just saying, yeah, I guess, I guess they will find an answer, but yeah. Yeah. It depends on eternal or um, timeless. No, in principle, no. Yeah. Time is a general amount of space. God. But if time is God. No. Maybe no. sorry to the other time. What does it mean? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I have a uh, general question on why uh, prior was interpreted uh, in this way. Uh, because even if he did try to make this ontological claim, it seems quite weak way to make an ontological claim on the basis of tense thoughts or uh, tense emotions. So it's something that makes, I mean, it's for me even more surprising that m so many people interpret it that this way, because the, it doesn't seem to be a very strong claim. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it has, I mean, prior Insist, uh, insistence was, I mean, he, he kept saying that we need, the uh, tenses are basic, are primitive, that we can reduce them to tenseless, uh, tenseless expressions or tenseless thoughts. So from that, it follows pretty easily to say, so there has to be, tense has to be real too. It's not only, I mean, I guess it follows and his insistence was always that. And actually he claims that um, in other books, later books actually, later papers, not in this, in this time. He, he does claim that, you know, in order to, for us to have tense in logic and language, we need tense in reality. But not through these arguments, but through other arguments to say they are, they are primitive. But the question when he says, why, why would anyone be thankful for that, for the conclusion of this episode is on a date, usually it's read as, you know, why would anyone be thankful for that? We need to be thankful for the fact that this episode has now the property of being in the past. It no longer has the property of being present and it no longer has the property of being future. And that would explain why we feel relief because if it, ha if it had the property of being future, you could not have believed. So it is, an, it is a simple explanation. You say, well, you're relieved because that event has now a new property. It is in the past and you know, it was a, he had another property a few minutes ago, he was in the present and you were feeling pain. And um, yesterday it was in the future, so you were feeling anxiety. And now you, re you feel relief because it, the event has changed, has you know, the flow of time. So it, there is a, it makes sense. What I'm arguing is okay, maybe it makes sense, but it doesn't follow from that. Uh, I mean, we would need another argument for that. Yeah. I guess one possibility is that if you accept that one three has different meanings and you, you think that meanings then they express different propositions and that propositions are made out of objects and properties and relations in the world, then different propositions mean different ingredients of the world. So for the A utterance or the now utterance you would have something tensed yeah. in reality. So so I think that's why. Yeah. So you have a tense. I don't know what Russell would say about that, but it's not like propositions being the meaning of sentences and 
may mm -hmm. go to where were things then. Unless you have another explanation, you are well, then there are facts there that make this proposition true that are tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the, I mean, one of the possibilities to, to be so wise. Yeah. So, and again, uh, for me it's also, I don't know what happens with, with uh, Perry because uh, you said, well, Pryor was a presentist. Yeah. So, so he was a defender of very serious. So it was natural to interpret him as giving okay with uh, that conclusion. But Perry is not, right? Uh, I mean, uh, he doesn't think that there are temporal facts or essentially indexical facts. No. Things like this. Or essentially indexical propositions or something like that. No. But this Kaplan and Dieber say they do. I mean, both say he does. Perry and, and David Lewis uh, argue that there are essentially indexical facts. Uh, and in, in, in the essential and essential indexical thought, fair, yeah. I was wondering, is that widespread? What do you think? Uh, with Perry, you mean, or with, I mean, with John? Yes, being with wrongly interpreted. What the the? As widely <laughs> as prior arguments. Uh, it might be. Uh, there's another complication there, and, and that is, uh, prior doesn't believe in propositions. I mean, particularly, he's very much against propositions and against Fregian propositions. So I guess that comes. But he doesn't put tenses there. But that's a. In the case of, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe. I mean, the, the the fact that you need tense facts and tense, so they think that. And the fact that when you think about a tense thought, what you're saying is the content of the thought is tense, and you're not thinking. You have a thought that is expressible in thought. Yeah, but I don't know if that's the source of misunderstanding with prior. It is a source of misunderstanding with Perry, but not with Pryor, right? I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. I don't think so. I think, I mean, misunderstanding with Perry, I think, is, uh, comes later. I mean, the misunderstanding with Pryor is, is, yeah, yeah. Is, it comes first. So that's why that was confusing me. Um, so can, can, can I just ask? Can I just, yeah. Sure. So is your worry that um, people interpret Perry? Because he and Perry and Grimms, I wanted to say, there's a single belief, but different belief states. People have confused um, him thinking as an, a, a thought which is essentially indexical, mm -hmm. in the sense um, of the, the thought content, when it's really the, just the belief state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is, I think that is a widespread. Concept. Yeah, it is. I widespread, but I don't know how it affects prior. I mean, I don't know if that's no, any no, relation. Really oh yeah, yeah that, that was yeah 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 yeah. So that is a very widespread confusion. Yeah. First of all, they put the Lewis and Perry together. Yeah, yeah, that's different, yeah that's very that's different that's theories. Yeah. So, and then they misinterpret both, probably. And it might also come from that, because if you think, for instance, when you have to say thought or something, what you're doing is you're attributing a property. So that <coughs> becomes the. Yeah. Just an understanding pattern. Yeah. Uh, to say that prior. Besides a paper, you uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't believe in proposition. But you say Fregian propositions. Fregian propositions, yeah. yeah. But does it believe in a single proposition? Uh, kind of, yes, yes. But but I, I'm not an expert on that. I'm beginning with and, that, yeah. Uh, does in the singular proposition deal with a time or not? But he thinks. You say, for instance, if you go. That's one way to understand it. You say, now it's over, and you say on June 15, blah, 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 it's over, you would express, I'm saying, you would express the same singular proposition, the same uh, time as a constituent. You would express the same proposition, what? The same proposition, singular proposition. If you say it's over now and it's over with a date. Yeah, not for prior. Yeah. No, not for prior. You cannot reduce, you cannot reduce, but you can, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't talk about that much because this whole proposition is prior is, you know, I, I don't know much about it. I, I, I know about the time thing. But he explicitly says, no, you cannot. They are not the same because you have 
one, you have tens, and tens cannot be reduced to a date. So there's something you miss in there. There's something you miss in there. So no, you need tens has to be a a, um, a primitive. You know, so you you can have a tenseless proposition, and then you need a tense proposition, and there's a, a primitive a basic difference there. Yeah. So wasn't he saying that because he was just a question that? Right? was trying to sort of encompass the notion of cognitive significance into the proposition expressed. That's, that, that would be closer to my interpretation, but I, I'm not yeah. sure it is that, because he actually explicitly says, no, okay, that was my example, but my example really, it actually, even in direct discourse, you don't need in, well, cognitive significance only a person, but, you know, it's just tense. Um, tense is Primitive is, is there, it's something different to say that something is past or something is now than to say it's a, a date. And this is something that has to be encoded into the, this different has to be encoded into the proposition or whatever in what you say. Yeah. But actually, I, yeah, this is something I, I have for the summer to read prior on propositions, yeah. yeah. He has a very weird way, actually. Uh, so weird Kaplan, not the Kaplan, but Kaplan, the, the real Kaplan. The <laughs> He doesn't put times into proposition, he put time into the circumstances of evaluation. Uh, prior sort of does too. A prior thinks, for instance, a proposition is not true or false eternally, kind of like, like Frege. Art, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, there are no eternal propositions. He doesn't. Everything is related to time. They are operator and the tensor. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's tensor operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, say you like to read an ontological argument to prior, and you thought the tense wasn't reducible to a B series. Mm -hmm. And you might think the B series still determines the A series facts, even if. You can't reduce one to the other, right? Yes, that's, that's, that's actually sort of what I'm claiming. Yeah, yeah that from that it doesn't follow that uh, A you series are like are the real thing, yes. So you can have, you can say, you know, if you think about, so if you think in terms of ontology of time, it's very complex, but you can have this sort of uh, ontology, what is time, you know, not, not what we, how we perceive time, so what is time, and then that would be a thing for physics, I guess, or metaphysician maybe to say and then another thing is how do we perceive time and how we talk about time and cognitive and that can one can be a and the other can be b i mean that's well, the thing like was there an intermediate position where you thought there really were tense facts you just think they're determined by the non-tense facts but you can't reduce one to the other so it'd be like you thought they're mental facts they couldn't be reduced to physical facts but still they supervened on or yeah, the, like the properties of being, if you are in the relation of being earlier than another point in your past, yeah, but then you will have A series. Yeah, uh, no, no, nobody, so yeah. Like they're all made true, but yeah, 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 if you have an A. B fact, we might yeah. still think there's still an A fact. Yeah, yeah, sure. Being yeah, 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 yeah. You, can have, you can have everything, yes. I mean, you, you can say, yeah, there's, there's a way to order points and times in terms of B, but the problem is if you accept, ontologically speaking, usually, for instance, if you accept the basic structure of time is in terms of A series, then you have the basic structure is change and, you know, and it moves. In B series, they don't move. So a moment of time is there and it's eternally there. An event is, happens at T zero and that's... And there is a problem there putting them both together because in, in, in A, an event happens and keeps moving. There is a flow and B is static. There are some attempts of doing a dynamic B series of time. That would be, I guess, what you're thinking. You can have the earlier and later, but you know you can still have the change. But but they are problematic. Usually, B time is seen as a st static, and A time is you know events move through time. Time moves. No, I get the, I understand the metaphor. Yeah. I was thinking you might not reduce something and still think there's a determination. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you can. And you can sort of have a midway position between. But prior, there are no tensed facts. I think the tensed facts aren't fundamental in the relevant sense. The way, the way it looked like your argument, I thought, was a, there's one fact that makes us all true. Yes. Right? And it's a B-series fact. Yeah. So actually, there's no A-series fact to do the relevant work. But I was thinking, 
an intermediate position where you think there is an A-series fact, then maybe with the dots tracking, even though it's all determined by yeah. more fundamentally by B-series facts. Actually, when my interpretation, say, imagine, for instance, prior is an A, defends on A theories, and he, th uh, he thinks he's a presentist, or only the present exists, only yeah. what happened exists, and the past and the future are unreal, or they're not real. So he would have no problem with my proposal either. He would say, well, there's one fact, and this is actually the only fact that, that whatever is happening is the only real thing that's going on. Uh, this is what determines whether uh, the sentence is true or false, because actually it's all there is, you know, it's the present. But he then develops the thing about uh, A theories, and, you know, so I, maybe I should have said, okay, this is a B fact, but, you know, you could also read it as an A fact if you're a presentist. And this is another reason why he would not have eternal truth, because if only present things exist, you know, you have a problem with the past and the future, then you need the tenses and the operators, yeah. It's a very cool ontology, but a bit minimalist, right? But that's, yeah. Sounds good, yeah. Cool. Thank you.